Okay, everybody, I think we found it. Boy, that's dirty. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to postpone the enthusiasm. I gotta clean that. Oh. Yeah, that's uh, that was dusty. Okay. Welcome back to the show, everybody. So the goal for today is to get the pinion shaft properly set up to the bevel gear in that rear end. And we might have a little bit of trial and error ahead of us because this is what I took out of that 5U parts machine. And well, the best we can hope for is to try and duplicate the prior setup as close as possible. So um, this procedure we're gonna do today, the contact pattern we're gonna try to shoot for today is gonna be quite a bit different than what you would see setting up a modern differential. So modern differentials have the pinion shaft heavily preloaded. And because you basically have both shafts preloaded, your contact pattern that you see in a no load state is virtually identical to what you would have in a loaded state. So the difference with this D2 and a lot of old tractors is we don't have a provision for preloading this pinion. They have a large ball bearing on this end, which always has a certain amount of deflection. And this other end down here is supported by this flat roller Hyatt bearing which also has deflection plus even allows the shaft to float in it somewhat. So the contact pattern we're looking for today on this is going to be quite different. Going into the manual here, we'll just read part of this paragraph. It pretty well lays out the target that we're trying to hit today. It says, with adjustments properly made, the correct tooth contact shown in figure A down here will be secured. The area of contact starts near the toe of the gear and extends about 30% of the tooth length. This adjustment results in a quiet running bevel gear and pinion set, which, because the load is distributed over the teeth within the proper area, will give maximum service life. So you can tell by the witness marks on these teeth that in their past life, they were indeed getting full contact across the surface of every one of those teeth. Although, I'll reference you back to the picture I took of that gear set and the contact pattern that it had when it was still in that 5U case. So hopefully that illustrates how our no load contact pattern on this is going to be significantly different than the fully loaded contact pattern. Because we have that deflection that is built into this bearing setup, you want to see in a no load state, heavy toe contact. And you can see that in that picture. And then from about here to here, it was just close enough contact just to erase the brush strokes that were in the marking compound. And then from here on out to the heel, there pretty much wasn't anything, but the witness mark is proof that when this is loaded up and deflection sets in, like I said in the last video, under load, these gears just want to push away from one another. That means you're gonna have somewhat of a cant that way, and it creeps that contact pattern right up across the full face of each tooth exactly where you need it. So now that we know what we're looking for, how do we get there? Well, it depends on what type of gear set you have. If we had a brand new gear set had never been installed in anything and it was the first gen straight cut design, we would knock out this line of sight plug. That would allow us to look straight down at the gears and we would shim the pinion so that the heel ends of both gears were in line with one another. That puts you in the neighborhood of the correct setup. You would then through trial and error, make fine adjustments from that point on to find the ideal setting but we have the second generation helical cut gear and you notice we have a plus seven scribed on the end of the pinion. That has to do with what is called checking distance. and It deals with the end of the pinion to the center line of the axle, typically involves calibrated factory tooling to take into account that value to tell you what your pinion depth shim selection should be. I don't know if Cat used any kind of special tooling in these when they were setting them up at the, at the factory back in the day, I suspect they likely had charts that said, okay, if you have a plus seven in your pinion, use this shim pack, and then if necessary, make fine adjustments from that point on. Like the modern pinions that I set up at the dealer, we have calibrated gauge blocks that go in place of the pinion. They use the new pinion bearings. It's all assembled into the rear diff, and there is a calibrated gauge tube takes the place of the carrier or ring gear, and then there are measurements I can take to give me the exact pinion depth shim setup. Hits right on target every time, no trial and error needed. But 
considering we have a once used gear set here, we are best off going to all of the settings that it had before we took it apart. So I did clean up 1113's original pinion depth shim pack and just for a point of reference, it was at 70 thousandths thickness. It's comprised of 10 thousandths and 5 thousandths shims. I did also measure the original 5U pinion depth shim pack and it was quite a bit deeper, quite a bit thicker, 100 thousandths on that. So we are best off using this thicker shim pack. 30 thousandths difference is quite a lot, but we do have a lot of difference in the design of the teeth. Even though the 5U case was about 11 years newer than this first gen 1113, Usually you can figure that your differences in, you know, machining is going to be well within a 5 thousandths range of tolerance. So, yeah, considering we had a 30 thousandths difference on this, uh, this depth setting, we're best off using this thicker shim pack. Plus, it's going to keep the pinion that much further out of the bevel gear, reducing the odds of me jamming gear teeth together too tight when I draw the bearing cage down for the first time with those three bolts. Okay, so we start by placing just the pinion shaft in. We are not messing with shims yet because they can be inserted after this is started. Okay, I've started the bottom two bolts on the bearing cage. That's kind of convenient the way they slot the bottoms of these shims. You don't have to take everything completely apart to slide them in and out. All right, shim pack is in place and we've tightened down all three of the bearing cage bolts. So I can tell you by the feel of it, we are not too tight on backlash. <laughs> so before we can do any measurements though, I'll put the input gear in place that's going to support the front of the pinion shaft. Okay, dial indicator is set on the bevel gear. Let's see what the backlash is. Looks like 45 thousandths. Yep, just like I thought. We're pretty wide yet. So, what is the backlash supposed to be? We'll go into the manual and it's 7 to 9 thousandths. So, yes, the 45 that we have with our current setup is wildly out of spec. Now, that 7 to 9 is perfect world scenario. That's a brand new gear set being set up for the first time. It's never been ran. We don't have that. This gear set is used. We don't know how many hours are on it, but judging by the witness marks on the teeth, it was running and contacting very well at its prior setup. So the best thing we can do right now is try to hit that prior setup and get as close to it as possible. That's why we pay so much attention to these before we take them apart. Um, I did mention in the post 5U transmission teardown video, this was at 22 thousandths backlash before I took it apart. That's a far cry from the 7 to 9 book spec, but remember 1113 was also running 23. So for us, that 7 to 9 thousandths is out the window. That ship has sailed and we're never getting it back again because that gear set is giving us every indication that it was running well at 22. That's our target. So if you tried to take a worn in gear set and tighten it back down and put it back like into that 7 to 9, I'll guarantee you're going to get a, a, like a whine, a howl. It's going to be a noisy gear. It's going to run hotter and it's going to wear faster. So in this case on our D2, we need to tighten the backlash before we even bother with a contact pattern check because we're still so wide, it, it doesn't even matter yet at this point. So, And on this setup, the primary means of adjusting backlash is to move the bevel gear. And we move the bevel gear by taking shims out from underneath one bearing cap and putting them under the other one. If we don't change the overall number of shims, the preload stays the same. All we're doing is moving the bevel gear and shaft side to side in this casting. And with this setup, the bevel gear will always chase the shims, meaning if I take a shim from the right side and put it on the left side, the bevel gear is going to move to the left. It always chases the shims because you're just moving both bearing caps 
in relation to the center line of this rear end. It works opposite of that too. If I took them from the left side and put them to the right, like I said, that bevel gear is going to chase the shims. That's how you move it back to the right. Okay, so we're jumping right into it. I'm going 15 thousandths worth of shims. I'm taking out from under this right side cap. And now we'll add that 15 thousandths to the left side cap. That will pull the bevel gear in tighter to the pinion. So why am I only doing a 15 thousandths adjustment when I need to move it 20 plus? That's because with helical cut gears, it's not always a one-to-one -one ratio. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Okay, both bearing caps are torqued back down. Let's see where we are now. Looks like 28 thousandths. Okay, we're getting pretty close. I think one more 5 thousandths shim swap will put us pretty close to our 22 target. You guys get the idea. I'll do that adjustment off camera, and then we'll see where we're at. Okay, so it turns out I had two more adjustments I had to make. So, and I always write this stuff down because it's a lot easier than having to go back and try and remember what you did. So we had the first adjustment, which was the 15 thousandths, took us down to 28. Second adjustment was just the five, and then that put us about 24. I did a third adjustment, another five thousandths. I'm running an average of 21 thousandths backlash. So this is the point where we can start to examine contact pattern. You can see I've got my marking compound out here. And we've got, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, about eight teeth that we marked up. We want to get, you know, a real good portion of that 12 tooth pinion anyway. So I'll just load the bevel shaft by hand to create some rolling resistance. And then I will carefully rotate the pinion by hand. And I usually run these through once. I'll stop and examine the pattern. And then I'll I'll run them through two to three more times after that and then see if anything really changed. So that's what we'll do now. Okay, here's where we uh, we don't sing the praises of the mighty GoPro because, uh, yeah, I'm never going to give you guys as good of a view as I can get with my own eye. But so look at our contact. We are in a no-load state, full-face contact almost all the way up. If this was a modern diff with a preloaded pinion, I'd be loving life right now and we would have it. But considering the deflection factor on these non-preloaded pinions, and once this thing gets under load, our contact pattern is going to shift heavily up to the heel. That's going to leave us lacking on the toe. So we're, we'd turn into heavy heel contact and it still would be a noisy gear. So we need, well, I can tell you by looking at it before we get too far off on a tangent, I can pick up where the contact pattern starts in the marking compound down here on the toe. And judging that against where the witness marks start on the toe here, the old shiny spots, I can tell our pinion is too far away. We're too far out with it yet. So I'm going to have to increase pinion depth in toward the center line to give us heavier toe contact and pull it away out here at the heel. So what I'll do... Like I said, we'll take shims out of that pinion, it's going to come in. That's also going to tighten the backlash because you're bringing that pinion gear deeper into the bevel gear. So I may have to undo that last five thousandths shim adjustment I did and move that bevel gear back out because we're at the stage now where one adjustment is going to affect the other. So I hope you're following along. If you haven't been through it before, it sounds kind of complicated. If you've been through it before, it's kind of like tying your shoes, but it's one of those things, it, the more you do it, the more it just makes sense. So I'll perform that first adjustment. We'll see where we're at. We'll pick back up again. Okay, everybody, I think we found the setup. Um, I'll just walk you through what I did. So we had, well, I made the fourth adjustment. I ended up taking 11 thousandths worth of pinion depth shims out. We had three of the two thousandths and then one of the fives. So. That took me to down to a 15 thousandths backlash and I didn't even check contact. I needed to increase that. So the fifth adjustment, 
I basically took one of those 5,000 shims that I had swapped prior and I put it back. That put me back out to a running average of 20 thousandths backlash and then I marked it all up, checked the contact and I'll tell you what, it is looking good. So we'll see if we can jive it with the trouble light here. Okay, come on, come on GoPro. Sorry about this guys, but I'll tell you, we're back to the heavy toe and Honestly, this looks, it looks even a little bit better than it was before. Look how nice and wide that is. We have full depth engagement on those teeth and we're heavy, heavy, heavy to about there, probably about the one third point. It starts diminishing a little bit. And then we're just enough that we erased brush strokes out to about there. By the time we get to the heel, we're just starting to lose it. And like I said, for a D2, the deflection factor, that's gonna flatten out under load. This is as good as you can get. I can tell you already, anything else I do is only gonna make that worse. So, and even looking at where we pick up the toe contact in the marking compound, we are matching our shiny witness marks perfectly. Guys, I'm kind of even shaking. It's hard to hold the camera still. <laughs> I know for a lot of people, stuff like this is really boring, but when I can, I can hit on the prior setup after swapping all those pieces to a different case, I love it. <laughs> All right, we've regained composure. Hat's not quite so far back anymore, so back to normal. All right, um, I think I'm gonna wrap the video right here. I got to look at how many minutes are on the camera, and I think this is enough to hit my ideal uh, video episode length, so plus I don't wanna do anything that's gonna put me in a bad mood at this point. Boy, I just love it when things go well. I'm just a geek when it comes to this stuff. What can I say? I don't know, to each their own, right? Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you for supporting the channel. As always, memberships link below. If that's something for you. If not, hey, cool too. I just appreciate you guys showing up, watching all the time, liking, subscribing, passing it on. Hope to see you back again. We'll throw some more gears into it next.